Special thanks to you, Richard, for joining us today. I remember we last saw one another at a Shabbos table at your home in Jerusalem. So that was a wonderful occasion. God willing, there'll be many repeats of the same. You've also been to Bloomington, and it was our pleasure to host you here. Bloomington at the moment is sunny and reading zero degrees. So wherever people are tuning in from, I hope it's a little bit warmer where you are. Which is minus 20, I have to say, for those for the audience in Israel and Europe, it's minus 20 Celsius. Oh, that's Europe true. Fahrenheit. Thinking, it's really I cool. Thinking in Fahrenheit. Great. <laughs> right, right, right. Thank I was you. wondering why you were complaining about zero degrees. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Fahrenheit. Anyway, uh, it, sh should be my, it should be my biggest complaint these days. I'd be a happier man if that, if that were so. I first discovered Richard Landis through his very active at the time website, the Algian Stables. This dates back to the turn of the millennium, where Richard was really on to major things far in advance of anyone else, especially the Eldora affair. And I've been tracking his important work ever since. The most recent representation of that work appears right here in his last published book. It's called Can the Whole World Be Wrong? Subtitled Lethal Journalism, Antisemitism, and Global Jihad. It's a book I strongly recommend for those of you who want a close and very, very powerful look at some of the threats that we face today. In fact, in the prefatory statement as what he calls a warning to the reader, Richard Landis writes in caps, if I'm right, we're in deep trouble. And Richard, I wish you were not right. But especially since October the 7th, the trouble has deepened a great, a great deal. Um, the chapter in the book, among others, that struck me in particular was a chapter on anti-Zionist Jews. And it begins with a sentence, this is the hardest chapter to write. And that was all the more reason I wanted to invite Gunter, uh, Richard today to speak on that subject in particular. It is hard to face. It's necessary to face, uh, if anything, in particular, since October the 7th, Jews of a certain kind have become enablers of anti-Zionism more assertively, more in your face than they have been before. Uh, it's a big, big subject. Richard can only open up parts of it today. I'm going to now turn over to you, Richard, and listen in, as everyone else will, with keen interest in all you have to say. Thank you. Um, I note that uh, shortly after 710, um, Andrew Pesson published a review in the, new, in the Tel Aviv Review of Books of my book entitled The Book That Saw 710 Coming a Mile Away. And my daughter said to me, you know, you were a Cassandra, and we just didn't want to admit it, and we hate it that you're right. And in a sense, I also hate it that I'm right. It's a very depressing thing, and I even in the 1990s already had developed an idea of sort of cycles of Philo and anti-Judaism, um, and suggested, which suggested that 2000 could be a turning point. At the time, I thought it would be a turning point for the evangelicals who were waiting for the rapture in 2000. And possibly if Camp David had worked in uh, a liberal, secular Israeli state, had given back half of Jerusalem and the West Bank to, uh, to the Palestinians, it might have, but instead it was the progressive left that went crazy. Um, and I'll come back to that. But uh, in any case, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, it's tough. The book, the title of the book, "The Whole World Can the Whole World Be Wrong," keeps coming back to haunt me. You sent me this morning a piece about some rabbis for a ceasefire who went into the uh, to the UN 
unopposed, naturally. Um, and uh, and one of their signs is the whole world says there should be a ceasefire. So, yes, the whole world, uh, as a friend of mine who looked at the volume said, oh, 500 pages of yes. Yes, the whole world can be wrong. Okay, so let me begin by, in, to some extent, not so much defining as identifying the problem. Uh, in 1988, in an interview with Philip Roth, Aaron Appelfeld, said the following, anti-Semitism, really what he meant here was racism directed at one's own people is an original Jewish creation. I don't know any other nation so flooded with self-criticism. The Jewish ability to internalize any critical and condemnatory remark and castigate themselves is one of the marvels of human nature. The feeling of guilt has settled and taken refuge among all the Jews who want to reform the world, the various kinds of socialists, anarchists, but mainly among Jewish artists. Day and night, the flame of that feeling produces dread, sensitivity, self-criticism, and sometimes self-destruction. So that was 1988. In 1994, a month after Arafat had given his very revealing Hudaybiyah speech when he was in South Africa, in which he basically said this whole piece of the brave for which I got the Nobel Prize is just a pretext. It's a Trojan horse that will lead to war when we're stronger. Um, Alan Meged wrote, since the Six-Day War, at an increasing pace, we have witnessed a phenomenon which probably has no parallel in history, an emotional and moral identification by the majority of Israel's intelligentsia with people openly committed to our annihilation. Now, I think that that pretty much sets the, the context. We're looking at something that is pretty much unique in the history of civilization. Um, there are, I mean, uh, what's his name? Roger Scruton. Uh, in 2004, it identified what he called oikophobia, which is a sort of loathing and 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 uh, rejection of one's own culture, uh, which he saw amongst uh, sort of anti-Western uh, progressives. Um, so it has produced uh, uh, there there is a similar phenomenon in the West. Outside of the West, I'm not sure it exists. And to be honest. Uh, I think the Western phenomenon is itself a sort of uh, secondary phenomenon that uh, draws much, much of its inspiration from uh, Jewish self-hatred. Um, so let me go for let me go through some of the explanations for how this extraordinary situation could have come about. And and the first one I think it's terribly important to understand is not really so much a criticism as it is an acknowledgement of the role of self-criticism in Jewish culture. Uh, in other words, I think that more than any other culture, and certainly foundational culture, like in a text like the Bible, which is thousands of years old and yet contains extraordinary passages that are self that are critical of the very people who are writing copying and preserving the text um you have an extraordinary emphasis on the importance and the ability of self-criticism uh in pirke avot there's a saying which you just you know I, I just don't know anywhere else in the world where you have a statement like this the sign of a lover of Torah is ohev tochachot, a lover of rebuke, um, which is really quite a remarkable thing that, that in order to grow, you have to be able to accept criticism. You have to be able to acknowledge it. Um, our problem that we're dealing with now is a sort of spillover of this. And I'll give an example in modern secular terms. This is a statement by Sigmund Freud at the beginning of Moses and Monotheism. The ego opposes other faculties, and by that he means the id, by observation, criticism, and prohibition. This brings, besides the inevitable pain, 
which involves both wounds to vanity and repression of instincts that want to discharge, a gain in pleasure to the ego, as it were, a substitutive satisfaction. The ego feels uplifted. It is proud of the renunciation as a valuable achievement. So this is a real pian of praise to self-criticism, and I think it also explains both uh, Freud's technique for what what psychoanalysis is all about, which is a ferociously self-critical discipline, and also explains why he thought it might be only a Jewish science, because the level of self-criticism that it called for was really quite exceptional. In general, let me put it this way, Jews are the Olympic champions, by far, of self-criticism. And when I say that, I can be pretty sure that the response from Jews, especially secular ones, will be, oh, no, we're not. I know we're not supposed to brag because it arouses resentment. And perhaps because of that, we don't brag about our self-criticism. Or perhaps because asking Gentiles to engage in even a fraction of the self-criticism that we take for granted is a big ask. And I put that out there. I think it's an exaggerated statement. But, and I'm perfectly willing to have people give more time about it. But I do want to put out, I think that there is a level at which Jews are engaged in levels of self-criticism that just are not common outside of Jewish circles. All right, then we get to some, oh, and incidentally, I, at one point when I was at Boston University, I remember going to... Steve Katz, who was the head of Jewish studies at the time, to uh, um, Elie Wiesel, who was a chaired professor at the time, and saying, I think we should have a conference on the history of self-criticism. Um, and I laid out how, you know, we could start with biblical self-criticism, go all the way up to 21st century Jewish self-criticism. And it was nixed because, and this was the word that came down to me, it was too political. All right, so now let's move on to um, some some of the less attractive aspects of this that draw it from an extremely healthy instinct. I, I think self-criticism is absolutely critical dimension of Jewish success in, um, in a meritocratic society. I mean, without self-criticism, you really can't improve, and Jews are always engaging in self-criticism. The problem is when it goes too far, and it not only means to identify what's too far, but it also means to identify what's driving it. Um, so let me start with uh, a problem that some people call moral narcissism, other people call virtue signaling, which is that Everybody wants a good reputation. Everyone has a major peer group, however small, from whom approval is critical. Thus, the temptation to signal virtue is ever-present for all of us all of the time. Indeed, the famous saying, hypocrisy is the uh, compliment that vice pays to virtue. Hypocrites pay virtue a compliment by their pretense to being virtuous. In the 21st century, where certain litmus tests for liberal credentials arose, virtue signaling became something of a requirement for membership in progressive circles. Often enough, it was more important to look good than to accomplish something. And the definition of moral narcissism became the adherence to positions and actions that brought little or even negative results for those whose cause one so loudly embraced, but great prominence to those embracing the cause. Liberal Jews were deeply implicated in this dynamic of the 21st century. They were rewarded by those in progressive circles for the brave self-criticism of Israel and punished for supporting the increasingly warlike right-wing Israelis. And the pressure only got stronger over time. So they unreciprocally, unreciprocably, self-criticized. They did not demand a fraction of the self-criticism from either their progressive allies or from their enemies. One of the things that that produces is what I call prophets in a strange land, which is um, 
most of the really severe critics of Israel today and for the last 20, 30, 40 years think of themselves as prophets. They see themselves in the prophetic tradition. The difference is that the prophets denounced the Israelites and the Jews in Hebrew. And they did it directly to them, whereas these prophets are denouncing Israel in foreign tongues and in the courts of the Gentiles. And I'll come back to this, but the significance is enormous and has to do not just with the substance of what you're saying, but also, I would argue, um, no, not just the, the impact of what you're saying, because it's feeding people who hate Jews, but also the substance, because the, the key component in the prophetic speech, which is the love of Israel, tends to fade when it's articulated in foreign languages and in, with two foreign audiences. Now, I think, you know, this prophetic stuff, and this is my specialty, messianic, millenarian, apocalyptic beliefs, there's a messianic syndrome that I call masochistic omnipotence syndrome. And that is, it's all our fault, and if only we could be better, we could fix anything. So it's inappropriate for us to ask for other people to be self-critical. All of the blame lies with us, and all of the power to fix things lies with us if we accept that blame and change. Um, now, there was a distinct presence of this masochistic omnipotence syndrome in the, on the Israeli and on the diaspora Jewish left during the Oslo, what I call the Oslo war process, that Hudaybiyah speech made it clear that for Arafat, this was a war process, but the, the, the positive some minded Westerners kept thinking land would bring peace, not war. Um, and during that process, you had this sort of messianic syndrome in which um, these prophetic critiques of Israel were somehow going to magically transform the Palestinians from resentful of us into forgivers of us and therefore lead to uh, this peace. And um, what, what was striking about it, it was what happened in 2000, and Mohammed Adur plays a key role in this, but in September, at the end of September 2000, when the Antifada broke out, the response of a great deal of the people who um, had been arguing land for peace and saying the more land, the more concessions we make, the more we're likely to have peace, um, were faced with what the right-wing people whom they denounced as having Holocaust syndrome because they were afraid that, you know, the Palestinians might ridiculously want to do what the Nazis did. How absurd can you get with that? Um, uh, their response to the outbreak of violence, literally, you know, I mean, Arafat and others have been using the Trojan horse analogy. When the, when the suicide bomb warriors came out of the Oslo Trojan horse and started their war against Israel, the response of the Israeli left was to say, it's our fault, we didn't give enough. And, you know, one example of that, of many, but uh, telling because of who was and where she was placed, the, um, the New York Times correspondent, Deborah Sontag, wrote an extensive study explaining why Arafat said no, and that it was really Israel's fault that he said no, and that he had acted perfectly rationally. And this was, and it was, if Israel had been less aggressive, then he would have said yes, which at least in my reading is completely ridiculous, but it was carried the day uh, with people, very intelligent people. Um, so I think you have this, this serious problem of a kind of masochistic omnipotence syndrome in which we take on ourselves all of the blame and it's the way to empower ourselves because if we say look you know we can't give enough to please these people they're going to go to war with us anyway uh 
we're basically saying what one Israeli said to me when I first made Aliyah here uh, about 2000. He said, for the first time I understood, it's not in our hands, you know, but in order to think it's in our hands, in order to give ourselves the impression that we can do something, the easiest way out for a Jew is this masochistic omnipotence syndrome. Now, that masochistic omnipotence syndrome overlaps significantly with what Sanders Gilman identified as Jewish self-hate, which he defined as, quote, Jews who see the dominant society seeing them and project their anxiety about this manner of being seen, this negative manner of being seen, onto other Jews as a means of externalizing their own status anxiety. So put in slightly less uh, social science ease, some Jews, seeing how negatively G Gentiles view them, turn on their own kind, holding them responsible for that hatred. If only they would behave the way we good Jews do, they tell themselves, then non-Jews wouldn't think so ill of us. Tuvia Grossman, after touring Israel in the West Bank in the early 2010s, presenting himself as a German sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, explained, it's a mental problem. For 2,000 years, Jews have been persecuted. For 2,000 years, they've been taught they're the worst. Some people can't handle it. And if you get a kind of Stockholm syndrome, they say, if everyone in the world says I'm bad, that I'm ugly, a thief, a murderer, a horrible, shrewd person, money grubbing, whatever, I must be. What can I do to cleanse myself of it? Catch another Jew doing wrong. That makes them feel better, makes their ugly skin look better. I think a good example of this is the reaction of two Israeli historians, Omer Bartov and Raz Segal, to the intemperate statements of Israeli officials after 710, in which they created a kind of moral panic of potential Israeli genocide, which in fact we're seeing play out at the International Court of Justice. Um, in 2010, uh, um, Howard Jacobson wrote Finkler's question in which he described the ashamed Jews. Um, and the ashamed Jews were the Jews who were horrified, not so much. I mean, they didn't know this, but it, it, they weren't so much horrified at what Israel was doing. They didn't know what Israel was doing. They were horrified at how Israel was presented by the media. And in this case, that's part of key part of my book. Um, 2000 is the beginning of the dominance of a school of journalists that I call lethal journalists. And I define as journalists who present as news Palestinian war propaganda. Um, so Adura is a perfect example, uh, Janine massacre, you know. No journalist gets into Jenin for three weeks, and yet for two weeks, they're reporting a massacre that comes only from Palestinian sources for which they have no confirmation. But the meme of Israeli massacre at Jenin, Israel loses the moral high ground, Israel, you know, it was the beginning of BDS in the West and so on. All of this uh, created, all of this journalism created an image of Israel that was utterly shaming to any Jews. And in fact, um, my first familiarity with Alvin Rosenfeld's work came when he wrote this brilliant piece in 2006 on progressive Jews and anti-Semitism. Uh, and how it turned out later when I read um, uh, Jacobson's uh, Finkler question, I went back and grabbed my copy of, of Rosenfeld because it was the actual guide to his roman clay of who these characters all were. Um, so, in, and the key point there was that these ashamed Jews in their desperation to free themselves from this unbearable shame it turned on Israel and, in fact, enabled some of the nastiest anti-Semitic discourse about Israel and about the Jews uh, to, to circulate. And, and that led me, at one point, I think this was about 2016, I first uh, 
suggested the idea that what we're dealing with is a Jewish proxy honor killing. Um, I, as a student of honor shame cultures, uh, have a fair knowledge of the phenomenon of honor killing, which I prefer to call shame murders because they're really murders intended to get rid of shame rather than killings that bring honor. Um, I thought I recognized an analogous process with Jews. And in fact, Jews who were the least likely to kill their daughters for shaming their family's honor. Constantly and repeatedly shamed by Israel's behavior as reported by the media, they began to feel towards this member of their family, Israel, in a similar way as say, Arab fathers felt towards daughters who were behaving inappropriately, wishing it, wanting it to disappear and spare them the shame. Not constituted to carry out such a vindictive act, Jewish progressives partnered with proxies like BDS and SJP and formed organizations like If Not Now and Jewish Voice for Peace, who would, in fact, be willing to do the dirty work. So uh, I, I think that there is a very important dimension of the inability to handle shame from people who feel that they're far above all of these matters, but are not. Which brings me to the last point I want to make before I open it up to questions. And that is um, about, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, I was in at Oxford, and uh, I met David Deutsch, who's a physicist. And Deutsch um, invited me over to explain to me the pattern. Um, he was writing, he's still writing, I don't know how long it's going to take, but he's in the process of writing a book uh, in which he is examining the ways in which um, otherwise rigorous thinkers have major sort of gaps of logic in their thinking. So he's looking for the sort of irrational slips of otherwise rational and, and rigorous thinkers. Um, and he's got a chapter, which he calls The Pattern, uh, and it's about thinking about Jews. And what he comes across, and what he detects, is a kind of subterranean, subatomic particle phenomenon, which nonetheless shapes most of the visible particles of what we call anti-Semitism, which is a kind of prime directive, that's my term, um, taken from Star Trek, uh, a prime directive in monotheistic civilizations in particular to affirm the legitimacy of hurting Jews. Now, that's a actually pretty remarkable statement because um, it, it doesn't seem to say much, but in fact, I think it does. Um, and he points out that, that this is true, not just of people who want to hurt Jews, people that we might identify as anti-Semites who say terrible things about Jews because they want to justify being able to hurt Jews, but also people who would sincerely insist that they would never hurt, want to hurt Jews themselves, and that they would not want to help people who want to hurt Jews. And yet, for some reason, somehow feel compelled to affirm narratives which are deeply historically illogical, but nonetheless fulfill this, this uh, let's call it pattern compliance of legitimizing hurting Jews. Now, um, the reason that I bring it up here is because he points out that there are many Jews who are pattern compliant without necessarily realizing it or ne not necessarily wanting to be pattern compliant. I think th therein may lie something of a uh, way out of this, which is to get people to become aware of what they're doing. But the fact is that the Jews who feel this need to comply with the pattern, to affirm narratives that legitimate hurting Israel, are major contributors to a discourse that's far more aggressive and far nastier. Uh, 
um, uh, Gerald Steinberg and later elaborated by Andrew Pesson uh, termed this Jew washing. In other words, uh, using Jews who are pattern compliant, who say things that help, um, hate Jews, um, using Jews to prove the legitimacy of hurting Jews. I'm not saying anything that Jews are, themselves aren't saying. So I just briefly go back to the passage from Moses and monotheism that I read you. Um, the book argues that the Jews killed Moses, who was actually an Egyptian, a Gentile. And Freud published this literally as the Nazis were taking over, leading an ecumenical outpouring of Jew hatred throughout Europe. Um, among other things, based on a belief that Jews deliberately kill anyone who opposes their dark agenda, Gentiles, even their own prophets. And somehow this brilliant man, who was so off about Moses and Akhenaten and monotheism, it, it, the, the book is a travesty, but okay, and you have to read uh, Yerushalmi's takedown of it. Um, somehow he was convinced that the world desperately needed to hear what he had to say, which is just extraordinary. You know, save it, you know, have it published later, even if it's going to be posthumously. Why do you feel the need to announce to the world that in your opinion, the Jews killed Moses just as the world is being filled with hatred of Jews? Uh, I'll leave that to the Freudians to figure out. What I'd like to conclude with here is um, a discussion of 710. Uh, actually, let me back up just a little bit. One of the interesting dimensions of uh, Deutsch's pattern is that for him, the reason why we get outbreaks of anti-Semitism is not so much because of all the stories that are circulating about how Jews are bad, but it comes when the pattern is in danger. So, for instance, modernity it produced a problem for the pattern. The pattern had relied in the West for a millennium and a half, uh, had relied on more than a millennium and a half, had relied on the charge of deicide. Um, with Enlightenment atheists like Voltaire, uh, it's kind of hard to hate the Jews for killing a god you don't believe in. Um, and yet the, the threat to the pattern was compensated for. So Voltaire's hatred of the Jews doesn't refer to uh, the, the, uh, the deicide charge, but virtually in every other aspect of what he has to say about Jews, he's replicating an Augustinian pattern which says, humiliate them, just don't kill them. Um, now, I applied and I, I spoke, I think, at ISCAP uh, several years ago, and it's available online. I, I, I applied his theory to what happened in 2000. That is to say that the in the period after the Holocaust, um, from about 1945 to 2000, uh, it was no longer politically correct in the West to engage in traditional forms of anti-Semitism, whether they were Christian or scientific, like racism and so on. Um, the only legitimate form of the pattern, the only pattern-compliant discourse that was permitted in the public sphere in the West was uh, the Palestinian grievance narrative. And there you could express all the feelings that you couldn't express directly about Jews. Um, and the advent of the Oslo peace process, the prospect that in 2000, Arafat would actually renounce the grievance that the Palestinians had against the Jews, actually threatened the pattern in a major way. And it came back with a vengeance, particularly through this lethal journalism that I discuss in the book at some length. Um, now, uh, it happened again on 710. 
In other words, on 710, the world had a look at just how ferocious Palestinian hatred was. This was not, uh, despite what people who tried to restore the pattern by saying it's all Israel to blame, anybody who knows the history of um, uh, occupations, far more oppressive occupations than the Israeli occupation of the Palestinians knows that that you know you don't get this kind of ferocious savage sadistic response and so for a brief moment there was a reconsideration amongst liberals who had accepted the Palestinian grievance narrative we want freedom we want dignity we want civil rights the israelis are depriving us of this and that's why we're frustrated and and we're desperate and therefore we engage in terrorism um but it's not really terrorism it's resistance um not only saw what hamas was about but saw the massive support that hamas got from Palestinian Authority, other Palestinian spokesmen, BDS, Students for Justice in Palestine, even CARE was, you know, Nihadawa was 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 in in rapture over what had happened. So all of a sudden, the sort of mask of the sheep of uh, of human rights and and freedom and dignity was ripped off the Palestinian uh, wolf's face. The sheep's mask was ripped off the wolf's face. And people could see what was really going on. And for a brief period, there was a, a real sort of pause in the legitimacy of the Palestinian um, grievance narrative, despite the efforts to fill the vacuum with these statements that came out and that produced such wishy-washy remarks from presidents around the United States. Okay. Um, and then on the 17th of October, in other words, 10 days after the, the, the massacres of October 7th, 10 days later, uh, a, a shortfall rocket from allegedly a uh, uh, Palestinian jihad rocket fell in the parking lot of Al-Ahli Hospital, possibly killed a dozen or two people, not more, and um, barely damaged. It blew out some windows of the hospital nearby. Now, the response of Hamas was immediately to announce that an Israeli strike had destroyed the hospital. Uh, Jeremy Bowen referred to it as flattened repeatedly, um, killed hundreds and hundreds of people, eventually 500, 471. Um, and this story was circulated at about 7.15 uh, in the evening Israel time. And rather than wait and get some evidence, get some shots of the hospital, get some shots of the dead, get some shots of anything uh, that's, that corroborated the claim, they went with these close-up jerky pictures of bodies being taken out one by one, um, which they repeatedly played over and over again. And they adopted this Palestinian narrative of the Israelis killing hundreds, uh, literally not just until dawn when pictures of the small the small crater in the parking lot were first made public, but for hours afterwards, well into the afternoon, things like CNN, networks like CNN were still repeating the narrative of this massive destruction that had killed hundreds and hundreds. And their response to the Israelis saying that it was a Palestinian rocket was to say, that's a lot of damage for, for a rocket. Um, and it is, but the damage was in their minds. It wasn't even in reality. They had no evidence for this damage, and yet they clung to it, even after accepting that the Israelis may have been right, that it was a Palestinian rocket. They kept reporting the massiveness of the, the um, 
the destruction and the loss of lives. And, and I think that what we see in that is precisely this restoration of the narrative that that somehow it had to be restored. And I've run across this from journalists. I, I talked with a, a, a very nice guy, sympathetic Italian journalist named Gabriel Barbati, who in 2014 was in Gaza and saw the rocket damage that killed 10 kids at uh, Al Shati refugee camp right near um, Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. And it, it, it was clear that it was a, a rocket by the Palestinians. And he tweeted it and so on. And I met with him subsequently and asked him if he would elaborate on why he thought he, it happened. And he basically said to me, and Jody Rudoran's remarks reflect the same concern, he didn't want to affirm the Jewish narrative. That, that somehow, if he were to tell the truth about what had happened, that would affirm the Jewish narrative. And that was something he didn't want to do. Now, why he didn't want to do it, obviously, Peter Group mattered. He needed, he needed the respect of his colleagues and so on and so forth. But, um, but it, it was quite striking to see the resistance to allowing a pro-Jewish narrative, no matter how accurate it was, to actually get confirmed. And I think that that in that incident and in the 20, 2017 or 1710-17th of October incident at Al Ahly Hospital, we see this compulsion to restore a discourse that legitimates hurting Jews. And um, I think that if we're going to, you know, I've spent the last 25 years, as Alvin can, can testify, fighting uh, the discourse that legitimizes hurting Jews. And I basically have failed pretty much utterly. Um, and I think that one of the things that we have to do if we want to address it is we have to address this subterranean dimension of the 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 importance and and Deutsch doesn't explain it. I, I have an explanation. We could go into it. I'm not going to give it to you now, but but even without an explanation, this is a an extremely important pattern that we have to consider. And I think that one of the ways to think about Jews who hate themselves is that they are being compliant with this pattern. So on that, I think I'll stop and open it up to questions.